Hey everybody, thank you for joining uh, our Connect Weekly Lessons. I wanted to share a couple of things with you. Uh, I sent out an email this morning about all our Zoom Connect classes and who you can contact if you would like to be a part of a Zoom uh, Connect lesson. I know in these uh, that I've been leading the last few weeks, uh, I refer back to the pupil material quite often. Uh, if you would like to have that emailed to you uh, on a quarterly basis, uh, I can set that up for you. It comes you know, in this kind of form, PDF form to you on a weekly basis. Uh, mine is sent to me every Tuesday. So you can go in and set that up ever how you would like to set it up once I send you that link. So if you would like to do that and get the Connect material, uh, we don't mind sending it to you. Uh, if we send it to you digitally, it's a very low cost. And uh, you know, we even have some printing copies laying around here. Uh, if you would like a printed copy, uh, we could set you one in the church office and you could come by here and get it. So whichever one you'd rather have, we want you to have access to it. Uh, I hope some of you that are not normally in a Connect lesson uh, are getting to use these. Uh, that's why we're doing them. Uh, I've enjoyed it the last few weeks and uh, have realized uh, how great this material is that we're going through. And it helps you uh, as you hear HD sermon on Sunday, whether you do that at Drive-In Church here or whether you're doing that online on Facebook Live or the YouTube channel, it connects with the, the, what HD is preaching on. So it helps uh, try to understand a little bit of that. He and I were talking this morning about uh, uh, at the end of this where it talks about uh, where Philip went after he talked to the eunuch. Uh, I was asking him about that city. And um, so er everything connects. That's what we're hoping. So if you're following along in the calendar and you're reading those five uh, scripture readings, that's this scripture we're going to talk about this morning. If you're listening to the sermon on Sunday, that connects with this. And then the Connect lesson that we're doing or the Sunday school lesson that we're doing, it all fits together. Uh, so it's kind of neat. Uh, you get it from multiple perspectives and uh, we just want you to have access to it uh, while all the COVID-19 stuff is going on. But uh, be in prayer for each other. Uh, join you a Zoom group or continue listening to it um, as you're listening to it now, whichever one uh, suits your schedule better. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Father God, I thank you uh, again for an opportunity to come together through a video. And Lord, um, these times are different. Uh, I know they're not uncertain because you have a purpose and a plan behind what you're doing, uh, even through this. And Lord, I'm reminded of that as we look at the lesson this morning. Um, there is no such thing as a chance encounter. It is all for your purpose and for your glory. And Lord, I, I thank you so much for what you're doing. And Father, you be with us. Uh, watch over us this week. Uh, be with us as a church, as we minister to our community. Uh, be with us as families that are walking through a different time than we've ever walked through before. But Lord, you keep doing incredible things in the midst of the chaos of the world that is around us. And Lord, we love you. We thank you. And you keep working in us and around us for your glory and for your will. And we pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So the title of the lesson this week is A Spirit-Empowered Evangelist. And we're going to look at Philip uh, and the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, if you believe what the world tells you, then you believe in happenstance. Um, things just happen. Uh, there's no reason, there's no rhyme, there's no, um, everything's a coincidence. Uh, it's a coincidence that um, atoms form together and that we have this beautiful world around us that we live in. It's all happenstance. And, you know, if we look at that and we, we think that everything's an accident, that we're just at the right place at the right time, um, accidents happen, you know, it doesn't lead to a lot of hope in our lives, and it doesn't lead us to have hope. Even in a situation like this, what's going on with COVID right now, that, you know, this, this is not um, a happenstance. God is in the middle 
of what is going on in our world, and he is doing some pretty incredible things. As Joy and I uh, pray every night together, one of our prayers is, Lord, thank you for what you allowed us to do today. We get to do and be a part and see some incredible things happen. Uh, we get to see addicts restored uh, to uh, sobriety. We get to see families that were walking through divorces, that their families are healed and they're walking together now. Uh, we get to see kids uh, turn their lives over to Christ. There, there's things that we get to do on a weekly basis that we look at and we're like, God, thank you for letting us be a part of that. And I think if you look at your life and what God's doing in your family and in the world around you, that you'll be pretty amazed at what God's doing too. And, and just be thankful for what God's doing uh, in the middle of horrible situations. So ask yourself, what chance encounters uh, have you experienced in your life or maybe you've heard about? Um, I'm reminded of Joy being at the Dollar Tree a few months ago. And uh, if you look at it as a chance, having a chance conversation with a woman in the line behind her who ended up needing a church family, who ended up uh, needing people to come around her and love on her and uh, is a part of Temple today. It wasn't a chance encounter. It was something that God had planned and God cares about who we stand in line with right now six foot away, but he does care about who we stand in line with at the grocery and at Walmart and and who we talk to and the conversations that we have. So this encounter that Philip is going to have is not some chance encounter. In fact, all through scripture, we see things happen that aren't chance encounters. It listed a few in the, in the student book. Uh, what happened with Joseph in Egypt was not an accident. Him being at Potiphar's house, him being put in jail, it was all for him to gain the throne and to be there when his brother showed up in order to show favor to his brothers and to his brother's family and for God's glory. Uh, David fighting Goliath. It was not chance that David was there to fight Goliath at that exact moment. It wasn't chance that Jesus ran into the Samaritan woman at the well. It was all part of God's will and for his glory, and for our good, and for the good of other people. So uh, we need to look as Christians at our world and know that there is no chance encounter. There is nothing by chance that it is all part of what God is doing in our lives. If you don't believe that, then think about the other side of it, that in whatever happened, if you think it is some chance, if 30 seconds difference would have happened, God cared enough about it to get you at that exact place at that exact moment to have that conversation with somebody. If 30 seconds, if you would have gotten behind a truck doing two mile an hour slower, you wouldn't have been at that exact point at that exact time to talk to that exact person. Throughout the book of Acts, we see examples of what has been called chance encounters that prove not to be chance encounters, but prove to be providential. One of those examples is from Acts 8, where Philip, an evangelist and follower of Jesus, is prompted by God to go on a journey that leads to an encounter with an Ethiopian and the expansion of the kingdom. The Spirit orchestrated this meeting, and he continues this work today leading Christians to use the scripture to show others Jesus so they can believe in him for eternal life. Billy Graham said, I want to tell people about the meaning of the cross, not the cross that hangs on your wall or around someone's neck, but the real cross of Christ. With all my heart, I want to leave you with the truth that he loves you and he is willing to forgive all of your sins. So, Acts 8, if you'll flip over in your Bible, and like we've been doing every week, we're going to read out of the Christian Standard Version, and we're going to read Acts 8, 26 through 29 first. And, you know, there's a thread throughout the Gospels and throughout the book of Acts that shows us that God's providence and God's planning is exact, and it is not uh, 
happenstance. People find themselves suddenly prompted to hit the road or suddenly show up uh, just in time to encounter Jesus or one of the apostles. And th through these many surprise encounters, God begins to build his church. One of these occasions is what we're going to read as we read Acts 8, 26 through 29. Uh, a disciple of Jesus that, if you look at it for some odd reason, was sent out in the middle of nowhere. Um, but we're going to see it was for something, and it was for a reason. Verse 26, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. It is the desert road. So he got up and went. There was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, and high official of Candace, queen of Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to worship in Jerusalem and was sitting in his chariot on his way home, reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. And the spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. You know, this story is great significance in the book of Acts, not only for what the story stands for, but how it paints a picture of, of what the Spirit does in our lives and, and what role the Spirit plays in our lives. So let's look at the story. Um, it talks about Ethiopia, and at this point in time, Ethiopia is about as far away as you could get. Uh, to talk about Ethiopia would be like talking about the other side of the world. Uh, even though when you look at a modern map today, it doesn't look that far, you have to realize uh, their mode of transportation and our mode of transportation was entirely different. So these regions were so far apart to everybody that uh, when the Spirit came to Philip and said, join yourself to the chariot, uh, it, this was a long distance. This was something that to put an Ethiopian in the middle of the story, um, I mean, it's these are long distances away from each other. So uh, it does mention and it does talk about the global uh, significance and global scope of the gospel. Uh, this gospel is not just for us in the middle of White House, Tennessee. Uh, this gospel is to reach the ends of the earth. And we need to be good stewards of what we're doing to take it to the ends of the earth. Uh, I love the fact that we are reaching through our foreign mission board unreached people groups. All over our world, there are groups of people that have not heard the gospel. Uh, it's an interesting trip to go to the Bible Museum uh, that the owner and founder of Hobby Lobby built in Washington, D.C. And in the middle of the Bible Museum is a room that has um, all the Bible translations and languages where the Bible is translated into on one side of the room, and then on the other side of the room is all the languages that the Bible has not been translated into yet. The largest majority of them are on the side of the untranslated group. Um, and it is a challenge that, you know, we've still got a lot of work to do. Uh, we still got a lot of work to get the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world. The story of the Ethiopian reminds us that the Lord is working in the hearts of many people to draw them to himself and that those people are responding. You know, that's the only hope uh, that we have that we can share with anybody. Uh, you know, uh, the great saying of us as Tennessee Ball fans is, uh, we'll, we'll, well, we've always got next year. That's always our hope. Uh, and then we get to football season and Hopefully this year is going to be better, but uh, we get to football season and then we start that again. Well, we've always got next year. Um, there's really not a lot of hope in who you're rooting for. Uh, you don't know what injury is going to do to the football team after the first few games. You don't know what the team's going to look like going into the third, fourth, fifth game. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, not a lot of hope in who you root for as a sports team. Um, the only hope that we have that we can share with our world around us is the hope that we have uh, through our relationship with Jesus Christ. How have you witnessed people looking for hope and meaning in all the wrong places? We see it all around us. Uh, people trying to fill a God-sized hole with anything but a relationship to God. Possessions, uh, drugs and alcohol, uh, pornography, um, 
gambling. Um, they try to fill that hole inside of them that can only be filled by a relationship with the Holy God. Um, only thing that's going to fill that hole is God. Um, the new vehicle that we want so badly, the new's going to wear off of it and somebody's going to ding us with their door in the Walmart parking lot or Kroger parking lot. Um, the new's going to wear off of it. But you know, a relationship with Christ, the new never wears off of it. Uh, Bible says that his mercies are new every day. And man, what an incredible thing it is to wake up each and every morning with new mercies. What it is to wake up every morning with a new relationship with a holy God um, and be able to walk with him each and every day. Philip was sent by God for just one of these encounters. Uh, upon hearing of the angel's command, Philip obeyed. He dropped what he was doing and headed out on the road. Uh, just a few verses earlier in the eighth chapter, verses four through eight, uh, Philip was enjoying a thriving ministry. Things were going great for Philip. Let me read those verses for you. So those who were scattered went on their way preaching the word. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah to them. And the crowds were all paying attention to what Philip said. And as they listened and saw the signs he was performing for unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. So uh, there's a whole lot of reasons that this encounter shouldn't have happened. Uh, there's a whole lot of reasons as we look at it from the outside looking in. In fact, there's six different reasons. Uh, first is Philip had a good thing going on in Samaria. Why would God call Philip to leave a, a wonderful and exciting ministry to go and talk to one person? Well, that's how important the one is. Remember the story of uh, he goes and leaves the 99 to go and look for the one. And we all at some time have been that one. Uh, that's how much he loves you. Another reason, um, he might, Philip could have just stayed home and enjoyed the community he was already a part of. Uh, why go and do this? Why leave a thriving, believing community to go talk to somebody else? Well, that's how much God loves us. Uh, another reason the Ethiopian might not have come to Jerusalem to worship God. We've all had those things happen. We have all the good intentions that we're uh, going to go do this or that or something else. And then something else happens and it pulls us off in a different direction. And we go and do that thing. Um, there was surely no shortage of religious opportunities uh, in Ethiopia and Africa uh, at the time the Ethiopian was there. So uh, another reason the Ethiopian could have just said, well, you know, there, there's a religion back at home. And I can go there. Uh, Philip might not have overcome the social anxiety that would have been accompanied with him talking to this uh, Ethiopian gentleman from the political government. Uh, Ethiopian ethnicity was different from Philip, but he removed all those barriers and all those hurdles out of the way because he knew what God was calling him to do. Luke tells us that uh, the Ethiopian was a high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Uh, Philip was an ordinary Jew living in Judea, a common person, an ordinary guy, and he was going to approach someone of the Ethiopian's higher station, and it couldn't have been easy. It would be like you walking up and talking to um, somebody that's way up in the government. Uh, I had the opportunity a few months ago to meet with John Rose, who is our... Um, U.S. legislature uh, in the House of Representatives right now uh, for our area. Uh, John's a good friend of Andy Nash's and just a gentleman of a guy. And uh, he wanted to talk about uh, the ministry that we're a part of here at Temple with our veterans in the Sumner County Jail and how he could help in that. So I went over to Gallatin and met with him and uh, his chief of staff, Ray Render. And, you know, I found out I was nervous going in because I was going to talk to a U.S. congressman, but um, John's an ordinary guy. Um, and But it couldn't have been easy for Philip to have stepped up and, and, and talked to this guy, but he did what God had asked him to do. All because the Holy Spirit spent, the Holy Spirit sent Philip to do this. Um, so how have you been surprised with how God led you or your church or your friends 
uh, to be on mission to go and do something with certain people. I know uh, here at our church, we um, have always had a heart for the people of, eight, uh, of Haiti. Um, you know, we that came through uh, some of our families that went to Haiti and fell in love with the people of Haiti and brought that uh, enthusi enthusiasm back to our church. Uh, we've always had a heart for the people of New York. Uh, now, uh, Michael Hill and his wife Shannon, uh, pastors at Bridge Community, uh, Ryan O'Neill and his wife Haley uh, are with them and working with them. So th there's different people groups that we here at Temple have a relationship with. And, you know, we've partnered with First Baptist Church, Granada, Spain. Uh, I hope to uh, later in the year when they release some of the uh, restrictions, get to travel to Granada and meet the pastor and talk to him about uh, how we can partner with them to work. They have a great work. Uh, the only church in the area that is working with the gypsy population in Spain. So uh, it's going to be neat to see what God does through those relationships. But um, are we being faithful to share uh, what God is doing through the leadership of the Holy Spirit? Which leads us to our second point. We need to guide people through the scripture and show them Christ. So let's look at verses 30 through 35 of the 8th chapter of Acts. When Philip ran up to it, the chariot, uh, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch said, how can I unless someone guides me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him in the chariot. And now the scripture passage he was reading was this. He was like a sheep to the slaughter and a lamb is silent before its shearer. So he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who will describe his generation for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch said to Philip, I ask you, who is the prophet saying this about himself or someone else? And Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus, beginning with that scripture. More evidence appears here to show how God was laying the groundwork for the encounter. The Ethiopian uh, was immediately receptive to, to Philip. He uh, was kind of like he knew who Philip was. Uh, whether he had heard of who Philip was or knew who Philip was, he invited him up to share with him. And, uh, you know, one of these things, again, he just happened to be reading those verses in Isaiah, not chance verses, uh, not chance at all, because he was able to use those uh, to lay the groundwork to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with him. You know, Philip was just an ordinary guy, but he was an ordinary guy filled with the Spirit. And he was filled with the spirit where he could go and talk to this unit. You know, sometimes the Bible is a scary thing because we look at it and we're like, gosh, I, I don't understand it. I don't understand all the idiosyncrasies. I don't understand uh, maybe the, the theme or the, I, I don't understand it in depth. Uh, you see behind me uh, sets of commentaries that I look at and I read. Uh, because sometimes it's hard to understand. Sometimes we look at it and we're like, gosh, what in the world is that saying? Uh, the set of commentaries I have over here uh, was actually a set of my dad's that he gave me, uh, written by B.H. Carroll, uh, who was a great Baptist father. Uh, we always claimed uh, being kin to him, but we're really not. Um, so the, the Bible sometimes is hard to understand, but Stick to the basics. We talked about that a few weeks ago when we covered the Easter lesson of the four pillars of the faith that, that Paul shared, that Jesus uh, came and walked this earth. He died. He was rose on the third day, and he appeared. Uh, that's the pillars of the gospel, and we need to stick to those. And Philip proceeds to share with him the good news. And, you know, it's it, it's nothing to be afraid of that you're going to share the wrong thing because you're not sharing uh what you want to share, you're sharing what God wants you to share. And there is a theme throughout Old Testament, New Testament that runs through scripture. Uh, in fact, B.H. Carroll wrote a book, a little small red book uh, that probably hundreds of thousands of copies were publicized uh, called The Scarlet Thread. And it talks about the blood of Jesus Christ is woven from Old Testament to New Testament. Uh, we need to share the good news. So do you think it's possible uh, to tell the good news of Christ from anywhere in Scripture? 
And it really is. Uh, one of the great things that the Gospel Project literature does is it points a connection to Christ. Even as we studied Old Testament scripture back in year one and year two, it points to the Christ connection because there's always a Christ connection in scripture and in what we're talking about. Be sure and share scripture. That's what this is all about. You know, Philip could have gotten in the chariot with him and shared this big theological point and his opinion and his opinion about who Isaiah was talking about, but he didn't share opinion, he shared fact. And be sure that what you're sharing with other people is not opinion, but scriptural fact. When you share things with people, you give people advice of, you know, hey, I'm, I'm in a tough situation and would you share with me what you might do that we remove opinion from it and we share fact. Um, I think that's important. You know, even Jesus rebu rebuked the Pharisees on this exact point. John 5, 38 and 39, he said, you don't have this word residing in you because you don't believe the one he sent. You pour over the scripture because you can have eternal life in them and yet you testify and yet they testify about me. He was saying to them, you know all the scripture, but you don't know who the scripture is talking about. So be sure you're sharing with other people, even though it's intimidating what the gospel is and the truth of the gospel. Last point, lead others to respond in faith. Verses 36 through 40. As they were traveling down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? So he ordered the chariot to stop and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away and the eunuch did not see him any longer, but he went on his way rejoicing. Philip appeared in Azotus and he was traveling and preaching the gospel in all the towns until he came to Caesarea. All of the elements of true conversion are here. Uh, that the, the Ethiopian eunuch was converted. He was eager to believe. Uh, he wasn't pressured to make some kind of decision and you know, you can do that in talking to somebody about Christ and, and try to make them make a decision. But he explained the scripture to the eunuch and then the eunuch was eager to make a decision to accept Christ. And when he did, he knew the need for baptism and he saw the need to be baptized. You know, evangelism and conversion are really that simple. Uh, scripture says it's so simple a child can understand it. And one of the things we need to understand is as we share Christ with people, that it calls for them to make a decision. Uh, one of the great things I enjoy about Jean Hannah is I, I've heard Jean witness to a lot of people. And when Jean gets through telling somebody about Christ, he will just ask them, um, you've got to do something with the information that I gave you. Uh, you can either trust Christ or you can make a decision that you're not ready to do that. But the gospel of Christ calls for a decision. Early in my sales career, uh, I worked for a company that sold construction supplies. In fact, the name of the company was Construction Tool and Supply. Uh, Mike Rogers hired me. I didn't have a lot of sales experience uh, going out and calling on people, but uh, Mike took a chance on me and uh, I really enjoyed it. But um, my thing was I thought people would buy from me just because they liked me. And you know, that's not absolutely true because, uh, yes, a lot of people do business with you because they like you. But um, one of the things that I struggled with was my sales just weren't what I thought they were going to be. And uh, Mike said, hey, let me ride with you one day. We'll ride down to Columbia. And I had a, a company that was one of my larger accounts that made industrial doors for airplane silos, for our missile silos all over the world. And um, they used a lot of abrasives and drill bits. And um, I went in uh, with Mike that day and I, I had a habit of always carrying a new product with me in just to show something uh, to who the purchasing agent was. And I went in and I showed Tim uh, these new drill bits that a company had come out with. And man, we drilled stuff with them. They drilled twice as fast and twice as many holes. And uh, we left there and went and got in the truck and we got down the road. Mike said, Mark, pull over for a minute. I, I want to ask you something. And he said, man, I am so impressed with your product knowledge and what you knew about those drill bits and how you explained that to him. He said, 
probably as good as I've ever heard, but he said, but there's only one problem. You never ask for the sale. You know, I, I learned real quick, you got to close the sale. And we went into the next account uh, down the road a little ways in Columbia and um, went in, same pitch. But I asked before I left, how many can I send you? And I got an order. Um, you know, you've got to, as you present the gospel, you've got to ask for the sale. You've got to ask people, what are you going to do? Because God is holding them accountable at that point because they've heard the gospel. They can no longer say, well, you know what? I don't know that God loves me. I don't know that God wants to forgive me of my sins. I don't know that God wants me to accept him as my Lord and Savior. None of that can be said anymore. So they're being held accountable for what you've shared with them. And you've got to ask, would you like to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior? What are you going to do with that information? What are you going to do with the information that I've just shared with you? You know, it's really that important because you're sharing the only thing with them that is hope. We've got to get to the work of calling people to Christ. Uh, we've talked about it two Sundays in a row, and this will be the third. Who are you sharing Christ with? Who is the one that you're going to go after? Who are you going to go and talk to and ask for a response and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. It's exciting to be able to share that good news with people. And I'll challenge you. You know, Philip um, went all the way to Caesarea. If you look over in chapter 21, verse 8 of Acts, it talks about uh, Philip going to Caesarea and staying there. And Exotus was on the way to Caesarea. And, you know, it's important because Philip kept moving and he kept going and he kept doing and it wasn't it's time to stop. It's time to rest. Um, people are dying daily without Christ. It is time for us to get busy. It's time for us to get busy and talk to people around us and share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, to the world around us. The spirit, like the wind, is always on the move, quietly leading the church and its members to take each preceding step in advancing the work of the kingdom. Life in the spirit is never a, about arriving, but about continuing with a hopeful eye toward the day when the gospel has been carried to every corner of the world and the whole earth is filled with the glory of God. The most ordinary of circumstances may be exactly a divine appointment. A chance encounter, as the world often sees it, might be a crucial moment in someone's life. There are no coincidences. But before we let this make us anxious or fearful of missing a key moment, let us not forget that we never experience these moments alone because the Holy Spirit accompanies us, guides us, and provides us with these opportunities. He empowers us for, his, for this work with boldness and with words, and he has already gone ahead of us to soften the hearts and open up the ears of people to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. So as we go on our way in this world, let us go and make disciples for Jesus Christ. I hope you enjoyed this week. If you need us at the church for anything, call the church office, call us on our cell phones. We're here for you. We love you, and we are looking forward to being back together again. Have a great week. Bye.